do read everything, but it's I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 9th. We will ri all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Jaden and Jonathan Hughes, uh, who are students of Deer Park Elementary School. Jaden's a kindergartner, and Jonathan is a grade in the fifth grade. So, uh, <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Our first item for this evening is our agenda. Are there any additions or changes to d tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? Uh, there are none. Uh, hearing none, <coughs> is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 OK, any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you very much. <coughs> Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her, her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Our first speaker is Dr. Farone. Two. Our second speaker is David Green. Three. Our third speaker is Kathleen Rybersick. Rib <coughs> Our next speaker is Char uh, Charlie Daroff. Five. Our fifth speaker is Andra Broadwater. Our sixth speaker is Sharon Saroff. Seven. Our seventh speaker is Andrea Barankina. Baran Barankina. <laughs> Our eighth speaker is Kristen Tilton. Okay. Our ninth speaker is Nate Saroff. And our last speaker for this evening is Anna Sir. So I think that's all our speakers that signed up. All right, moving through our meeting, our next uh, uh, item is the superintendent's report. And for that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. If we take a quick glance at our calendar, we recognize that summer is quickly coming to a close. Um, to, this morning, we had an opportunity to welcome over 700 new teachers to Baltimore County. 600 will be brand new to our, our, our classrooms, but 100 who started after new teacher orientation uh, this past school year. Um, I want to thank the county exec for joining me today as lo along with our board chair. Um, and I think Ms. Kathleen Causey um, came by as well, too. But it was a lot of excitement at Perry Hall High School. Marching Gators started us all. We had an excellent um, rendition of the Star Spangled Banner by Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts students. And we are really ready on our way to begin the 16-17 school year. Um, I also want to commend the Board of Education, who just recently held this retreat um, at the Suburban um, Club in talking about goals for the board over the course of the 16-17 school year. So I want to personally commend you for your dedication to the work um, that's coming up this school year. Uh, two very quick comments on policies that the board will be considering um, very shortly. Uh, policy 6303, uh, which is the board's proposed heat policy, I want to uh, say that I did share with the board at the retreat that I was in conversations with our state superintendent um, and asking that as we begin the year with 34 unair conditioned schools, if we had to make a decision whether to close those schools or not, will it be allowed to count as a waiver, um, as we typically do for the seven schools that are in the Hereford zone, we have to close for inclement weather. Uh, Dr. Salmon has agreed 
agreed um, that she'd be willing to, in fact, do that. Um, however, even though it was agreed upon, it is with caution, um, as we do have the shortest high school day um, in the state already. Um, and every single year when we make the decision of how long the schools stay open, uh, particularly at the end of the year and working with our bargaining agreements, uh, bargaining units, we always make it knowing that we are very short on high school hours. Um, but with that being the case, uh, if the board does make a decision, uh, then we will be able to adjust um, accordingly. The other policy is 6401, um, which is our advanced academics policy. I want to set the record straight. Um, there was um, some notation made uh, that we were getting rid of gifted and talented in Baltimore County, which is in fact not the case. I do want to thank Wade Kearns, our coordinator for advanced academics, for his work. Um, I want to thank GTCAC for its advocacy. Uh, we've talked a lot about making sure we're providing for the needs of all of our students, but we are not getting rid of gifted and talented in Baltimore County. However, um, I do understand that there has been some concern around the name gifted and talented and having that in the policy along with advanced academics. And so I've asked our staff if they would work with Ms. Romaine Williams, who's chair of the board's policy review committee, to review the name in terms of ac advanced academics slash gifted and talented. Um, and I think that Ms. Williams has agreed that they would be looking at that at September the 19th uh, meeting. Last but not least, um, on August the 20th, we're going to be celebrating 75 high school graduates who have been completing their high school course requirements to our extended learning opportunity. And so um, we implemented this about three years ago. We wanted to make sure that all of our students had an opportunity to graduate and graduate in the year that they finished their course credits. And so on August the 20th, we will be recognizing 75 students for meeting that milestone. As we count down the last remaining days of summer, I want all of our teachers to enjoy uh, the next seven days uh, before you'll be joining us again. And all of our teachers know they've been participating in PD all summer long. Many of our teachers were volunteers today um, at TABCO with new teacher orientation, and many have already started to set up their classrooms um, already. Um, but to our students, we are counting down the days until we welcome 112,000 students to our 173 schools. So enjoy the remaining days of summer, and that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, our next agenda item is the chair's report, and my comments kind of parallel the superintendent's. It was um, very uplifting today to welcome over 700 teachers into Team BCP. BCPS at, as a part of the new teacher orientation. Um, this event is certainly a reflection of how Baltimore County Public Schools is growing and is refreshing itself. Our new teachers come with renewed energy and the skills needed to impart 21st century learning to our students. The new teacher programs are also a reminder to recognize how essential our teachers are in the efforts to provide the best education possible for our 112,000 students. Our teachers must be recognized for the very challenging tasks that they embrace every day of the week. It is my sincere hope that they will feel supported by the Board of Education and the entire BCPS team. Meeting with the new teachers today was a bit discouraging as it suggested that summer is quickly coming to an end. Just a moment ago, it seemed like we just got started with the season. Uh, there has been much going on at BC BCPS through the summer months. Since our last board meeting, as Dr. Dance mentioned, the board did have its annual retreat. And I want to publicly thank the, our stakeholders who provided input on how our board might, might improve its operations. Um, we've, been come, we've begun the work to transform your suggestions into action and improve the manner in which the board conducts its business. Uh, there are a number of important policies that will come before the board in the coming weeks. Board members have received quite a number of emails and letters during the summer. The input from the community and stakeholders is critical to allowing the board to make informed and efficient decisions. We continue to encourage all of our stakeholders to communicate with the board as we decide on policies issues for our system. The school year will begin for our students on the day after our next board meeting in a couple of weeks. Several board members will join the superintendent in welcoming our wonderful students back to school on the first day. We all must keep our focus on providing the best experience academically as well as support them socially and emotionally during this coming school year. These are all my comments and uh, now I'll turn it over to our new um, board member, our student board member, Ms. Aislinn Bratt with some comments from her perspective. Thank okay. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Aislinn Bratt and this year I'm going to be a senior at Towson High School. Um, I applied for this position because like PCPS, I take my education very seriously. As Benjamin Franklin once said, I have a his an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Like all student members before me, I have a history of leadership and service to my community, but what's really important is not who I am, it's what I'm pledging to students. 
As a student member of the board, I recognize I am no longer simply acting in my own interests or the interests of Towson High School. I'm representative of all 112,000 students. That said, I believe my best contribution uh, I can make to BCPS students is to advocate on their behalf in the boardroom and to help them take advantage of all BCPS has to offer outside the boardroom. The core purpose of our school system, according to Blueprint 2.0, is to foster learning. As a student member of the board, I believe the best way I can further that purpose is to open communication with all students, allowing student voice to be heard as part of goal three of Blueprint 2.0. Having consistent and reliable access to student voice is a prerequisite to solving any problems facing our students. How can we effectively solve issues of equity if we don't know who feels maligned? How can we effectively target and prevent bullying if we don't know who the victims are? Encouraging communication with students will also teach them good citizenship, their value as stakeholders in BCPS, and what opportunities outside the classroom BCPS can offer them. Therefore, my goal this year is to increase the frequency and effectiveness of communication between myself the board as a whole, the BCS staff, and students to promote a better learning environment. To achieve this goal, I will first and foremost always be available by email at, a at abrat at bcps.org, through Twitter at balcosmob, and on Instagram at bcps underscore smob. Additionally, I'm going to provide an online form for students who request for me to visit their school during the upcoming school year if they want to bring something to my attention. Um, and finally, I was given the opportunity by Dr. Dance to host a panel on issues of equity at the upcoming ANS. Uh, meeting on Friday, yet another way BCBS can get feedback from its students. Of course, this is just the beginning. I'll be working with communica the communications team all year on ways to stay connected to students, and I appreciate everyone's support in advance. Um, really quickly, before I turn it back over to Chuck, I'd just like to say thank you to all the staff who have helped me transition into this position. You all know who you are. And finally, I would like to extend a special thank you to Diksha for always being available to help me in any way possible and for leaving very large shoes to fill. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Bratt. Thank you. <laughs> All right, our next agenda item is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct conduct of this meeting are out of order. I would ask you to observe the timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time is expired. We do have a very full agenda tonight, and we want to be respectful for all those um, participating. So the microphone will be turned off at the end of the allotted time, or if the speakers happen to address things that are not part of education in Baltimore County. So at this time, I'd like to call forth our first um, person from our advisory group. Uh, the president of TAPCO, Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Baton. Hello to some of you again, because I saw you earlier. Uh, so, good evening, uh, Chairman McDaniels, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Um, so here we are at the beginning of a new school year, just a few days away, as many of you mentioned. Everyone is counting, I think, down to the hour at this point. Uh, the new teacher orientation today began um, uh, helping to acclimate the over 600 new teachers to Baltimore County with a few more uh, on the way. Uh, with these new teachers come the hopes and aspirations of another generation of teachers. These folks come to teaching because they love students and want to make a difference. It is our job to make sure we provide the support, training, materials, and guidance necessary for their success. That, in turn, will help them provide the best possible outcomes for our children. 
We in Baltimore County are lucky because we have many initiatives and supports in place or being put in place to assist our teachers in their profession. These are critical and as we continue to work collaboratively on refining, adding or removing the various resources we are providing, it is the input from the teachers that keeps us moving forward in the most useful, productive way possible. I am hopeful that we will be able to stem the tide of the teacher flight that is taking place all over our country. I have heard from so many of my colleagues from across this nation about the difficulties they are having finding qualified teachers for their classrooms. We are truly lucky in Baltimore County. If we continue to address the issues we face carefully with fidelity, thoughtfulness and determination, and of course with perseverance, we can't help but be successful in overcoming the obstacles in our path. I know I am ready to go and really excited to get on with our school year, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart Sicking. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I want to start by talking a little about struggling readers, much like I did last month. Um, research tells us, I think we're all learning now together, that the best time to help struggling readers is during kindergarten and first grade. And the National Institutes of Health maintains that 95% of struggling readers can be brought up to grade level if they receive help early. Knowing this, I want to draw attention to item M1 on the agenda tonight and support the contract expansion requested and all efforts to provide and expand literacy intervention programs. Even more so, I want to call attention to item M3 on tonight's agenda, the letters contract. We have a problem in that all classroom teachers, including reading teachers and special educators, don't always have the most up-to-date research on how the brain works when it comes to learning how to read, write, and spell. And they don't all have the knowledge of the best methods of intervention for different struggles, such as dyslexia. The demands on educators are enormous, and I find it difficult to fault teachers for not knowing everything all the time about everything. But that is why it's absolutely critical for the county to provide a clear and accessible pathway for our teachers to gain this knowledge. Item M3, the new contract for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, will provide professional development modules designed to address specific literacy components. It's be it benefits first cohorts and eventually, hopefully, all 2,500 teachers from kindergarten through second grade, along with special educators and reading specialists. While these materials will also benefit middle school and high school teachers of struggling readers, it is essential that from this point forward, we put an end to students getting out of early elementary school without being identified and helped. That is, 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 is exactly what this plan is trying to accomplish, and we continue to be excited about the collaboration between the offices of special education and English language arts, and wholeheartedly support the contract on the agenda tonight, as, along with the training process outlined in its description. Before I end, I also wanted to say a word of thanks to all of the staff in the Office of Special Education and all teachers and support staff in all of our schools who worked so hard all summer to provide good experiences for our children with extended school year needs. While some have been enjoying vacations, these teachers and support staff have been working very hard all summer for students who have summer needs, and I wanted to say publicly that those are deeply appreciated and noticed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is the president of our PTA Council, Mr. Emery Young. Good evening. Good evening. I had prepared remarks this evening about um, policy 6401, and Dr. Dance, of course, has stolen my thunder. <laughs> I'm not going to <laughs> read my <laughs> remarks, but I will say it is uh, welcoming to hear that you've heard the concern of 
parents and community members about the wording in the policy and going to send it back to have that looked at and reviewed. Part of that will go to something that I've always mentioned, um, clear and concise communication. So hopefully we can kind of see where the process broke down, where the confusion happened and ensure that something like this doesn't happen in, in the future. To our student member, congratulations. Thank you. I say to you, take advantage of this opportunity. Ask all the questions you want. Pick everybody's brain because you have knowledgeable people here around you. This is a unique chance for you. And yes, it's hard to believe it is August and school will be <laughs> starting soon. Um, but once again, we're looking forward to another productive and hopefully uneventful year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, to the board, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Count Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, and that's Ms. Julie miller breitz Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. When I was a school librarian, colleagues asked me on different occasions if I would ever consider being a principal. My answer was always, no way. <clears throat> being the principal is the worst possible job. Long hours, personnel issues, reduced contact with the kids. I was thinking about that as I was writing out my notes for tonight, and that's when I realized the Board of Education members might actually have it worse than the principals. <laughs> uh, being the voice of the school system and hearing the voices of all the stakeholders who are never quite happy with how things are going has to be incredibly tough. The truth is the school system is asked to do a lot and they deal with a multitude of issues day in and day out, some of which I in my capacity as the chair of a stakeholder group bring to you. My experience has always been that BCPS clearly has the best interests of the students in mind. And what a diverse group of students. Public schools must take all comers and provide each of those comers with the free and appropriate education they deserve. And beyond that free and appropriate education, it must be fair, it must be equitable. So what is fair and equitable for gifted and talented students? Remembering that gift is an informal term that is used to describe people's best qualities, whereas <coughs> giftedness is a technical professional term that is used to describe students with unique academic, social, and emotional needs and who require differentiated education. Acknowledging that there truly are gifted and talented students throughout all Baltimore <coughs> County schools and that they are exceptional learners who require specialized learning environments. Adopting common terminology so that reliable data on this group of students can be collected and their progress can be monitored. Adhering to Maryland statute and regulation that gifted and talented students can be named as a special needs population with unique needs. So what is fair and equitable for gifted and talented students? Identifying them putting the students at the core of the policy and not the program that is in place to serve them, being explicit, deliberate, and transparent about how and when children are identified, using responsible identification protocols that ensure that underrepresented populations do not continue to be overlooked, adhering to Maryland statute and regulation that gifted and talented students be identified. So what is fair and equitable for gifted and talented students? Being accountable to them requiring that BCPS evaluate and report annually on the gifted and talented population by providing disaggregated data about their identification, participation, retention, and assessment of growth levels, making that data easily available to all stakeholders, adhering to Maryland statute and regulation that data regarding the gifted and talented population be separately reported on. A board policy is where the school system makes a commitment to serve all the comers, as diverse and exceptional as they may be. How can we expect that Baltimore County will continue to effectively identify and serve gifted and talented students if it is not committed to in writing? We strongly urge that policy 6401 be pulled from the review timeline for further dialogue and consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now move into the general public comment portion of our meeting and our first speaker is Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all, happy summer. Good evening. And Mr. Chairman, board members, briefly. Um, engagement of the public is really very important 
for the school system and for the public. So my recommendation for the Board of Education to consider popularization of the stakeholders. My observation is less than a quarter of the stakeholders speak to the board in every board meeting. I think the public needs to know about the stakeholders and their accomplishments much more than what we hear. And the Board of Education, I believe, needs to assess which stake group is effective and which one is not, and to address the ones that are not really showing up or not contributing. Involvement of the public is really important, and I hope nobody would shoot me down. I suggest that you consider to make the public speakings up to 15 instead of 10. Keep it for three minutes. Um, Shutting the microphone, I again believe, gives the wrong impression. Uh, the chair can always <coughs> say stop, and I think verbally it would be far more acceptable. Um, answer every email. I thank the board members that do answer the email, no matter how brief it is. Um, I believe the Board of Education needs to work on that. And last but not least, I have really um, concern about the closed meetings. My sense, my ESP, right or wrong, that the Board of Education members are discussing non-secretive matters in the closed meetings. Uh, obviously, I'm not really there, and I'm not member of the FBI or anything like that, but ESP is what I am guided with, and I ask you to consider to be more open. Last but not least, the school system is really so important for our society, and the events around us within the country tells how important your actions or lack of actions. The focus on science and math and gifted and talented is really important, but also it's important to build a new generation that love each other, care about each other, regardless of color, national origin, religion, belief, etc. And I, I really want the board to remember that it's not just math and science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. David Green. Hello. Hello. Uh, whenever anybody talks about uh, religious holidays here, I hope they will remember this colander I have in front of me. I say that because uh, in recent years, uh, a group called Pastafarians have been complaining about un religious unfairness, and some Pastafarians have been granted the opportunity to have uh, this headgear on their heads as they get driver's licenses taken in places like Massachusetts. Uh, but more about them later. I see three different paths that this uh, group could take when it comes to uh, closing schools on religious holidays. Uh, the first is no big change. Um, this uh, would retain the unfairness to Muslims and other religious groups, um, so I don't think it's a good uh, it's a good change. I have that on my blue sticky, which stands for bad, sad, and so forth. Um, I think uh, if you follow that course of no change, Dr. Fayron will probably come for another 10 years and speak before you, and he'd probably be a good shot to break Cal Ripken's record uh, for consecutive board meetings. Um, so that's not a very good choice. The second choice is to tack on Muslim holidays onto the Jewish ones. Um, that, I think, makes the unfairness worse. Um, and it would attract Pastafarians to your meetings and people from other religions. So rather than having one, one group coming, you'd have multiple groups coming to your meetings. So what, what's another choice? It's not a perfect choice, but I suggest that what this board needs to do is revisit the old board's decision from 20 plus years ago uh, and that means a couple of things. It means documenting the criteria for closing schools on religious holidays, which to my knowledge has never been done. It's never been written down anywhere. I would also suggest revisiting the level at which school closing decisions are made. It's currently made for the whole county. Why can't we do it at the school level? Uh, that would reduce the impact. So uh, some other considerations. 
I think it's impor a ba important basis for my recommendation here is the fact that that Christian holidays should be viewed as a special case. And that's based on hundreds and hundreds of, of years of, uh, of tradition. The criteria for closing schools should be only practical matters like how many teachers would be absent on religious holidays. Um, so what would happen if we did this? I think uh, not everyone would be happy, but I think Dr. Fayron might be happy enough that he might skip a few board meetings and maybe watch the Olympics or go to a baseball game. Um, I think you would avoid having people, <coughs> Pastafarians and other religions come, and I think you'd have shorter meetings and you'd give other people uh, with very important issues the chance to speak here and make space for Thank you, Mr. Green. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Kathleen Rabarchik. And I'm going to ask you if I got close at all <laughs> with your last name. name. There's very few of us in Maryland. Uh. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kathleen Rabarchik. You were very, very close. Good. I'm a BCPS parent as well as an employee um, and currently in the Office of Student Behavior and I'm also a former substitute teacher for the county. I've also been a member of the Glendale Glenmont community for 40 plus years. I moved in when I was 18 months old. Community served by Halstead Academy, Lock Raven Technical Academy and Towson High School. Several of our community's children are in the technology magnet program over at Cromwell Valley Elementary, my fourth grade son included. Um, this year, CVE will be piloting a wonderful program where my fourth grader is going to be learning Java, which I think is fantastic. If that program continues next year, he'll be actually learning computer coding in fifth grade, which is remarkable. Now, a lot has been said about technology and Baltimore County Public Schools in the past couple of months. Not all of it's been positive. I've watched the neighborhood forums, I've watched the Facebook feeds and the conversations very intently because my son goes to a technology magnet school. Um, but times change, and so do we. While I understand why some parents may be nervous about technology being part of the curriculum and becoming so much a part of the curriculum, it's necessary. Um, you know, in 1980s, when I was in high school, Commodore 64s and Commodore 128s were state of the art. We've come a long way since then. Um, my sons deal with Facebook and YouTube and various other things in their social lives and at school they have a lot of technology around them because of the schools they're in and the place they are right now. Um, but you know by graduate school in the 90s I had a state-of-the-art laptop or what I thought I was. Now it's a very nice doorstop. Hmm. Technology changes fast. Um, and we live in a world where computers are the norm now not the exception at least in our culture. Our children don't like on slates with chalk anymore. They don't write in composition notebooks with pencils anymore. They do work on computers. And I think it's very vital that BP, BCPS continues their technology march so that we can keep up with the way the world is evolving. When our kids come out of high school, unlike me, they won't be typing their term papers on a typewriter. They'll be dealing with computers in every aspect of life. Every day when I go to work, I punch in on a computerized clock, and then I turn them on my computer to begin my day. Um, I just want to thank BCPS for being very forward thinking on this as a parent, um, as a sub former substitute teacher, and also as someone who is part of you. I'm very, very proud to see that you're on the cutting edge of this. Thank you so much for making a difference for our kids. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Saroff. Hello, uh, hey. good evening, members of the board. Good evening. Um, so I am a, a rising senior at Lansdowne High School. Uh, Lansdowne High School was recently uh, this year um, nationally accredited for their uh, business and finance program. And uh, there's a lot of other programs at Lansdowne as, uh, as well that are notable. It is a magnet school. Um, it was up until this year, I believe it was one of only two schools to have both a voice and instrumental music program. Uh, we also have a, uh, a very uh, good dance program. And uh, one of our recent uh, alumni is currently on Broadway. Uh, someone who graduated in 2015 during their senior year, performed at Carnegie Hall. It's, there's, there's a lot of positive uh, things going on at Lansdowne, but at the same time, 
uh, these these positive things cannot continue with the current state that the building is in. I, and I saw on the agenda that there was uh, some sort of uh, approval going on for new buildings, for the schematics for new buildings at Delaney and Woodlawn. And there is a movement at Lansdowne to also get a new building. Uh, I'm a very big supporter of that. Um, and the, the plan that is usually favored uh, by most of the people I talk to at Lansdowne is installing portable air conditioning units uh, and uh, while the uh, new school is building, being constructed because installing central AC would tie us to a building which has numerous problems. The foundation is sinking. Our stage uh, has leaked several times. Water from the lake behind the school has leaked through the stage. Uh, we have lots of leaks in the ceiling, cracks in the floor. It's, there's a lot of very significant structural issues. <clears throat> and I do not feel that renovation can fix these issues. I'm not alone on this. And installing central AC as the current plan is would tie us to a school <coughs> which has numerous other problems. I understand there was just a cost analysis uh, uh, done about building a new school uh, for Lansdowne. And I think that it's, we're kind of just dragging our feet here with this. We, we really do need to move forward on building a new school. The cost analysis really only told us what we already knew. And we need to just move forward on this so that we can continue to provide uh, a quality education at Lansdowne. Because the more the building degrades, education's going to degrade along with it. We, it, it's hard to focus in hot classrooms. It's hard to focus when the ceilings have cracks. And it needs to be fixed uh, expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Our next speaker is Andra Broadwater. Andra, sorry, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about Start School Later. There are three pillars to good health. You eat right, you exercise, and you get plenty of sleep. As parents, we can influence the first two, the, but the third sleep has really been taken out of our hands by schools. Our kids are told when to show up and where and their consequences if they don't. But starting in upper elementary school, kids' bodies change. It's called a sleep phase shift, and they physically can't fall asleep till about 11 o'clock by the time they're in high school. At the same time, these kids need about nine hours of sleep. And nationally, only 6% of kids get that. In Baltimore County, our schools start as early as 7.10. That means thousands of students are on the bus in the 6 a.m. hour or earlier. Sleep-deprived adolescents are more likely to be obese, have migraines, be depressed, and have suicidal tendencies. They're more likely to engage in risky behaviors like smoking, drinking, and fighting. They're more likely to carry weapons to school, and they're more likely to get into car accidents either as a driver or a pedestrian, and they have lower school performance. When schools delay bell times, measures of mental health improve, truancy, tardiness, and dropout rates decrease, teens actually get more sleep at night, and the rates of car crash actually decrease. Academic achievement also increases. Studies in districts that delayed start times found statistically significant increases in overall student achievement, with the greater increases from lower achieving and students from disadvantaged backgrounds. In fact, a Brookings Institute report estimates that test score gains following a schedule change were equivalent to those achieved by reducing class sizes by one-third. Finally, delaying start times benefits athletics. The American Academy of Pediatrics reports that fully rested student athletes were 68% less likely to be injured than their peers. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine reported significant improvements in athletic performance when students were fully rested. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association recommend that schools start no earlier than 8.30. The Maryland Department of Health even recommends not starting before 8 o'clock. Last spring, the legislature passed the Orange Ribbon Bill, encouraging districts to work with the community and move school start times to be at least consistent with those recommended by the State Department of Health. 
So delaying start times has been found to lead to increased academic achievement, better mental and physical health, better attendance, and higher athletic performance. PTAs around the country, or around the county, are hearing about our efforts, and not only have six local chapters, but also the PTA Council have voted to support studying this issue. I urge you to consider the harm our early start times are doing to our students and our community, and the benefits that can be found by making the decision to start school later. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm here to bring to the attention of the board some concerns in special education. I've heard a lot of positive, but I want to bring something that is negative and needs to be addressed as quickly as possible because it affects accountability. Um, it affects performance of these students. If you have a student that is inappropriately placed in a program and is not receiving the, the services that they are supposed to be getting, their performance is not as good. And yet what I have seen over the past couple of years is the school system allowing schools to continue to put students in incorrect placements, um, to force parents to go to mediation as opposed to trying to resolve problems on the school level. Um, I just filed a mediation yesterday on a problem that could have been resolved on the school level six months ago. Um, this is, these are things that should not be allowed to continue, and yet the people that are making decisions on the school level are not being reprimanded, are not getting consequences. They are being allowed to continue to make these wrong decisions and not, and just these students are suffering as a result. Um, I could bring numerous examples, but I think that the board needs to address not just training these individuals, but coming up with some kind of a way to hold them accountable, and either by monitoring or making sure that the services that these students are supposed to get, that they get them, and if a decision is made incorrectly, that they seek to resolve it before it gets to the level of mediation or due process because it's not in anybody's best interest to have to spend money on, spend, on going to time in the courtroom. It's everybody's best interest to spend that money and time in the classroom where these kids can be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Our next speaker is Alexandria Barankina. Good evening to the board and to our superintendent. Um, I apologize, I'm very ill prepared to speak because I only found out about um, the policy 6401 last evening and by accident through social media. And it's a grave concern to me as a parent, and I come here as a parent, not as a professional social worker, which I am. Um, I'm concerned on so many levels. Um, GT kids are kids with special needs. If we don't recognize that, then we're missing the boat. They may be on a different level and they may be on a different end of the spectrum of special needs, but they still have special needs. When we're trying to change the designation, my biggest concern as a parent, when we stop calling it GT and call it something else, 
My fear is that the funding is going to go away on some level. Some programs will not be available. Um, the, the opportunities will disappear. And that's, that's my fear, because I know my child is succeeding because of these programs that we now have. He's a very bright child, but he needs these programming so that he can succeed. If that's gone, if he is mainstreamed, or if there is inclusiveness in the classrooms, he is with the kids that distract him, he will not succeed. The current programming is ideal for these kids. Well, maybe not ideal, but it works. You take it away, and we're going to have we're going to have a generation in 20 years uh, that could have been a taxpayers that are supporting all of the other programs, and they will these kids will be functioning at a lesser level than they can, and it really should not be acceptable. And I understand what you're saying that you're going to re-examine um, this policy, that you're going to look at the verbiage, and I hope it's not just. Um, a knee-jerk response to all of the concerns that the parents have verbalized. I hope you're actually going to go ahead and do that and consider what I'm saying. Um, there are so many opportunities uh, for these gifted kids, but they need to be identified early enough and presented with these opportunities. The brightness and the brilliance is um, there, but if it's not developed, um, it's not going to go very far. It's going to be dimmed down, dumbed down, and um, just um, achievement will not be there for these kids. In other words, the opportunities in life. So please, when you go back and review this policy, do a good job. Look at the verbiage, because it is important. The language is important. The designation of GT is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Tilton. Good evening. Thank you, board, for your time today. My name is Kristen Tilton. I'm with the American Cancer Society. Um, since 1913, the American Cancer Society has fought for every birthday threatened by cancer in our community and in every community. By taking what we've learned through research, we've contributed to a 20% decrease in cancer-related death since 1991. And therefore, there's actually over 12 million cancer survivors nationwide right now. So how do we do this as a community? There are four things we can do, and four things that our students can do and faculty. First, we can help people stay well with prevention information and education for both students and faculty in the school and outside. Two, we can help people get well, and unfortunately some people do get diagnosed with cancer and we're here to help with that. We hope they come to us for the help. We have a 1-800 number that's actually 24-7. You can even call on Christmas and they're there. You can go to cancer.org. We have a road to recovery program where you can actually take a cancer patient to and from their appointments and it's completely free. We have our Look Good, Feel Better program which actually helps cancer patients look and feel better. And also many more programs. Um, we also find cures. We are the largest um, non-government funder of cancer research, and we do currently have 47 Nobel Prize winners in our cancer research programs. And finally, we fight back. And what we are asking for is both your students and faculty <coughs> to want to be involved in anything cancer related with American Cancer Society and also the Relay for Life event. They can volunteer, get service hours, and actually learn how to put through events, which will help in college. They can start a team and learn leadership. They can also be on the committee and also honor our survivors and caregivers. I wanted to thank you for your time again, and I will have information for everybody if you'd like it on how to get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Nate Seroff. Hello. Hello. I wanted to talk to you guys about, um, as an alumni at Lansdowne High School, I wanted to address the issues of preparing students for adulthood. I went to American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is a school in New York City, conservatory, um, which is highly up there in conservatories. It's one of the best in the United States. 
Um, unfortunately, though, this school does not have things like a nurse or a health department or a meal plan. Um, so I had to do a lot of the cooking and things like sewing on my own. I think it is beneficial, though, for students to have things like cooking and sewing and other skills in the classroom. What we mostly teach students nowadays is how to write a resume and how to do other things, such as getting your college essays together. But we don't teach that until the senior year, when you can actually get a permit for, a co for having a job at the age of 15, when having a resume is taught at the s when you're in senior high school, it doesn't really make sense to have it taught senior in high school when many people probably already have jobs um, at the age of 15 from having permits. Um, we also don't teach students such things as how to apply for jobs in filling out applications, what certain things mean on applications. We don't teach students how to pay taxes or how to get a car. I don't know how to drive a car, but it is an important thing to know. Um, we also need to be teaching students things like cooking because, for instance, as I said, the only reason I know how to cook is because I have a cookbook and my mom taught me. But a lot of students out there don't really know about cooking. And by not being able to cook, there's going to be an increase in helping restaurants, but also an increase in waste production. By increasing waste, I mean you're throwing out clothes that you don't know how to sew, and if you have a takeout box, that creates a lot of waste also. Um, so we're not helping the environment by not educating our kids in certain things. Um, I think we definitely need to better prepare kids for the future in how college works and what is out there. And also, I think it's very important that we teach kids that it's OK to do things like change their major or um, not know what their major is when they first go into college. 80% of students change their major before their senior year in college. I learned that my junior year in high school, but not that many students know that. And it's a very important thing to teach them because a student might go into college and then realize they chose the wrong thing and might not know that it's OK to change what they want to do. And if they don't know that's OK, then they're going to feel guilty about it. And a lot of people change their jobs after college and go into a completely different career than they went out to seek. And if we're not teaching people that it's OK to change what their major is or change what their career status is, we're going to have a lot of people in unhappy careers. And I think we need to better prepare students for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last uh, public speaker is Anna Sir. Um, hello. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. I'm here. Um, my kid has been in BCPS. Uh, she's going into 10th grade. She started off in Grange Elementary when they didn't have air conditioning. She got into the uh, magnet program at Parkville when they didn't have air conditioning. And now she's in the magnet at Patapsco, which isn't going to have an air conditioning until she graduates. Um, so we're, I'm really, really happy about this, this school closure policy for heat. And I'm really happy that you listen to us. And it's no longer just the temperature on the dial, but you're also taking into account the heat index, the humidity. We were just out in Nevada, 115 no problem. We come back here, 40% humidity and 95 degrees, and you're completely dying. So that was great. Um, I'm, I'm very slightly concerned. What I'm hearing on social media is that a couple of principals are interpreting your um, principal principles shall allow students to carry water bottles at all times, regardless of the heat or air conditioning status. I'm hearing that some conditions principals are saying you should carry little plastic bottles like that. You're not allowed to have the refillable bottles. Uh, some parents can't afford to get you a little plastic bottle every week. Um, and some parents are concerned about post-consumer waste. So I'd, I'd appreciate it if you clarified the policy to the principals and say you can have a refillable mm -hmm. plastic bottle at all times. Um, other than that, I'm really happy about the heat closure policy. Um, I'm also a little bit would like to uh, encourage you to think of other ways to make things less bad at the schools that don't have air conditioning now. Uh, I know that you don't want to buy the temporary air conditioner or the, the put in temporary room air conditioners because obviously they're going to become useless the moment you put in central air conditioning and they can't be moved to outbuildings or anything like that. But 
if you could look into perhaps things like some of the theater department lights get very, very hot and more modern lights produce less heat. Um, I know that some of the electrical systems, again, their older electrical systems will produce more lights. So if you could look into other ways of reducing the heat produced at the schools that don't have air conditioning yet, then maybe conditions wouldn't be quite so bad for the kids. Um, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. And thanks once again for the heat closure policy. Yeah, thank you for your comments. All right, our um, next agenda item, we move into unfinished business. We have some policies uh, up for third reader. And for that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Chairman McDaniel, Superintendent Dance, fellow board members, and to my PRC members, one of whom is away sick and the other is away on vacation. But I'm so glad that I have Kathleen Causey here with me tonight. Um, I am presenting tonight for you third readers, um, and to my knowledge, there's been no additional comment on them with the exception of policy 6303, which is the heat policy. And we are going to actually make an amendment to uh, policy 6303 in light of Superintendent Dance's comments that he will be able to obtain a waiver um, for the closure of the um, non-air conditioned schools. So what I'm asking the board members to do tonight is to um, approve all of those um, policies. There are seven of them, six with the exclusion of the, the heat policy that I'm going to get to in just a second, that you would approve all of them tonight. Um, of course, first and second readers, you've had them. You've had them for a while. With regard to the heat policy, all we're doing is amending it in section 3B to add the words non-air conditioned schools. So we'd be asking the superintendent to close um, all non-air conditioned schools when the heat index is forecast to reach at least uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit at any time during the following day. And then in section 3C, the statement will be deleted that says early dismissal of the remaining non-air conditioned schools cannot be done safely and would affect transportation services throughout the country. So again, those are minor changes consistent with Superintendent Dance's um, acknowledgement tonight. So in light of that, I'd ask that we, um, Mr. Chairman, that we would move to Okay. So, now, would you um, should we do them all seven together, or would you? Is there I mean, any reason? All seven be done okay. together. All right. Um, is there a motion to uh, accept the recommendations of PRC for the seven policies that are presented this evening? So moved. All right. There's no need for a second. Is there? It's been moved. And uh, is there any discussion at this time on any of the policies? If not, I'd ask all those in favor of accepting the policies, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you very much, board members. This is the right thing to do for the public. I appreciate your support. Thank you. All right, our next uh, agenda item is new business, personnel matters. And for that, I'll call forth Dr. Mayo. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. Good evening. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters. Termination, termination certification requirements not met, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, certificated appointments, area education advisory council appointment. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Do I have a motion to approve exhibits J1 through J7? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion at this time? If not, all those in favor of uh, the approving J1 through J7, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Thank you. Next item is the consideration of the administration administrative appointments, and I'll turn over that to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels and members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal of Deep Creek Middle School, Principal of Woodlawn High School, Assistant Principal Colgate Elementary School, two Assistant Principal positions for Dundalk High School, Assistant Principal Franklin Middle School, 
Assistant Principal Golden Ring Middle School, Assistant Principal Newtown Elementary School, Assistant Principal Overly High School, Assistant Principal Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts, Assistant Principal Perry Hall Elementary School, Assistant Principal Perry Hall Middle School, two Assistant Principal positions at Randallstown High School, Assistant Principal Whitlawn High School, Executive Director of Academic Services in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, Director of the Data Warehouse in the Department of Research, Accountability and Assessment, Director of Digital Safety and Innovation in the Department of Innovation and Learning, People Personnel Worker for the Northwest Area for Student Support Services, and Specialist in the Office of Special Education. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K? So moved. There's a second. Second. Any discussion at this time? If not, all those in favor of approving uh, Exhibit K, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion Abstain. Uh, we have one, Ms. Williams abstains, but the motion does carry. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I would like to introduce a few new members to our team, but introduce individuals who are being promoted tonight. First is for the assistant principal position at Dundalk High School, currently right now an assistant principal for Portmouth, uh, Portsmouth Public Schools at IC Norcom High School. That's Mr. Tim Arrington. And Tim, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations. Welcome back to Maryland. Next is for the principal position at Deep Creek Middle School, currently right now an assistant principal at Lock Raven High School. That's Thomas Baker. <laughs> Thomas, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? In the hallway. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations, Thomas. Next is for the assistant principal position at Whitlawn High School, currently right now an educational administrator for Fairfax County Public Schools at Herndon High School. That's Kelly Barr. <laughs> Kelly, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, I have a friend Congratulations to you too, Brandy. Next is for the Director of Digital Safety and Innovation, uh, currently right now working with Washington County Public Schools in the Operations Department. That's Mr. James Corns, Jr. With you tonight? Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Welcome to the team. Next is for the assistant principal position at Overly High School, currently right now a science teacher at Newtown High School. That's Robert Covert. <laughs> Robert, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Uh, my wife and my husband. Oh, there. there they are. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Next is for the pupil personnel worker position for the Northwest area. Currently right now, a health teacher at Kenwood High School. That's Jennifer Cox. <laughs> Jennifer, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, my mom and sister Perfect. They can stand up so we can recognize them as well. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. <laughs> Next is for the assistant principal position at Colgate Elementary School. Currently right now, an educational associate at Gwynn's Falls Elementary School for Baltimore City Public Schools. That's Anne-Marie Glenwicky. <laughs> Anne-Marie, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I do. I have my husband, my parents, my mother-in-law, my brother. Oh. Perfect. <laughs> the entire family can stand up so we can see you all. Everyone can stand up so we can see you all and congratulate you. There you go. Yeah. Welcome to the team, Amory. Next is for the specialist in the Office of Special Education, currently right now a resource teacher in the Office of Special Education. That's Kenya Golden. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations. Thanks for coming, Dad. <laughs> Next is for the assistant principal position at Randallstown High School, currently right now a history teacher at Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. That's Mr. Jonathan Hughes. And I see your proud new principal here with you today as well, too. But you have family and friends. I think all of them just entered. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everyone can stand up so we can recognize you. I see the family at the door. <laughs> Congratulations, Jonathan. Proud son. That was just the way, same way five years ago. Uh, current, uh, assistant principal position at Perry Hall Elementary School, currently right now a resource teacher at Halstead Academy. That's Caroline Neary. Maybe in the other room. Yeah. Uh, no, we issue. Uh, 
Congratulations, Caroline. You have any family or friends here with you tonight? Uh, my husband and my wonderful Congratulations to all of you. Next is for the director of Data Warehouse. So currently right now, the Data Warehouse Manager for Johns Hopkins Healthcare, that's Kimberly Sanner. Kimberly, welcome to the team. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Perfect, congratulations to our family. <laughs> Next is for the assistant principal position at Perry Hall Middle School, uh, which is a new position we've added because the enrollment of Perry Hall um, has increased. Currently right now an English teacher at Perry Hall High School, that's Amanda Shanks. <laughs> Amanda, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I do, first my kids are watching. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Can all of you stand so we can recognize each of you? Congratulations. That has a huge smile on her face. So congratulations on your promotion. Next is for the assistant principal position at Newtown Elementary School. Currently right now a classroom teacher at Franklin Elementary School. That's Rebecca Snodderly. Rebecca, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Perfect. Congratulations to each of you. Let's see if they came in. Next is for the assistant principal position at Golden Ring Middle School. Currently, right now, a resource teacher at Kenwood High School. That's Amy Wazlowski. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your promotion. Have you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, I have a husband, Neil. Perfect. Can you all stand so we can recognize you? Congratulations. Next is for the assistant principal position at Franklin Middle School. Currently right now a compliance specialist in the office of Title I. That's Joshua Wilson. <laughs> Josh, congratulations to you. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? No, I thought if I called my four and two-year-old, they might try to be up there with you, Dr. That would, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that would have been perfect. <laughs> congratulations, Josh. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the executive director position in the Division of Curriculum Instruction for Academic Services. Currently right now the principal of White Oak uh, School, that's Melissa Wistead. And Melissa, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations to all of you. We do have one who cannot make it um, in attendance, um, and I look forward to introducing her to the board and members um, of the community. She met a small number of individuals in the community most recently, but that's the principal of Woodlawn High School who's joining us from Baltimore City Public Schools and currently an assistant principal at Reginald Lewis High School of Business and Law, and that's Georgina Garrett A. She made it. Congratulations. <laughs> Georgina, we are so excited to have you as a member um, of the team and great interview uh, that you had with me. And I, I talked to several members of the community who had an opportunity to meet you and they are ecstatic um, oh, about yes. your work. <laughs> <laughs> and Georgina's a former cheerleader, um, so she's going to be cheering uh, for the Warriors. So, and you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, my husband is with me. Um, one of our assistant principals, Mr. Gordon, is here. And our new assistant principal is here that I'm meeting. Congratulations, Georgina. We're looking Thanks. forward to working with you. Okay, that concludes the administrative appointments tonight. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Dr. Chairman. Dan yes, Mr. Collins. Uh, Dr. Dance, I can't uh, fail to mention, as you might expect, um, I'm especially proud of Jennifer Cox and Amy Wozlowski. They are teachers at Kenwood High School being promoted, and everyone knows of my love and affection for Kenwood High School, so I have to give a special shout out to any of our Kenwood family. So congratulations to all of you. But uh, I just have to make a special mention of all my friends at Kenwood. So thank you for the, indulging me once again as I praise Kenwood. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Our, uh, our next agenda item is new business action taken in closed session. And for that, we'll call forth Mr. Nussbaum. How are you? I guess we'll wait a moment while the room clears.
on now. Yeah. They took it. They took it. That would be really great. I was actually going to open it up to anybody who wants to request, so oh, okay. um, I'm going to that call and I will make sure that I'm going to this one. I got one from Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. I lost the group. I'm here. We need a quorum set to vote. Good for you. Where did he go? He's going the other way. I think you're on your own. <laughs> As long as you have to vote on anything, you're good. It, we you, do have to vote. That would help. Yeah. <laughs> Here we come. Can we regather? Yeah, if you, if you see him. You want me to leave? No. <laughs> oh, you know what? That was an off How many do we have? Three, five. We don't have enough. Oh, I was like, thank God. Right. Right. I, I, did I know you are, Michael. Out. I have to. Yeah, tell Nick because. Oh, thank God. Of course, it was still are. They uh, yeah. here's the. He needs to put on big boy clothes. Uh, yeah. June, let the record show I'm not holding things up. What? Let the record show I am not holding things up. Then Michael Collins is seated. All right, this is true. Gotcha. We got you. By the way. It's Ann. This time. Okay, we have seven. <laughs> From All right, um, the record show Mr. Nussbaum, I think you can. We can move ahead. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered three appeals regarding confidential employee matters in its quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, these three matters were considered on the record. On the record, as no request for oral argument was made in either case. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in those matters, which were. Hearing examiner numbers 15 60, 16 42, and 16 64. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those, uh, is there any, any discussion at this time? If not, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion does carry. Thank you. Three orders in the table. Please make sure everybody signs all three. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. Much. Nussbaum. All right, our next uh, item is new business, and these are contract awards. And for that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we had contracts committee meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon where we discussed these four contracts. and. Um, had all of our questions answered. Several members of the board who are not on the contracts committee were in the audience, so I don't expect that there's very many questions on any of them, but I would move that we adopt all of those. And I would like to just add uh, a point of information. Um, in our discussion, I questioned uh, the how, how it could possibly be that the children uh, could advance um, in 60 days to their grade level, but um, I had an extended conversation with our distinguished and uh, wonderful director of curriculum, uh, Mrs. White, uh, between uh, before dinner, and uh, she indicated to me that she even went, even went and double checked what the, what uh, the, they had been told. But then then also, she reminded me that these are children are all in first grade, so they don't have. <laughs> They don't have very far to advance, but I just want to give a particular shout out to uh, Verlita for doing her usual, such a thorough job and such a such a make an effort to to be to be complete and candid with us at all times. So, Verlita, a little shout out to you, and uh, thanks for that um, that additional insight. But I would move that we accept these contracts, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, it's been moved that we uh, approve items M1 through 4. Is there some discussion now? Ms. Miller, yes. yes. I really just had some discussion on number 2. Um, and, it, and that's the community school program. I, I would 
I would like it, especially going forward in the future, if we had a better understanding of new initiatives like this uh, prior to being asked to vote on contracts. We've really not had information given to the board regarding the community school program, and I see this as, as really kind of just the start of a whole new school system initiative. Um, so I'd like to know what services are being provided through this. I, I was here for some of the discussion here, but um, I'd like to know what services and how will success of this initiative be measured. Good evening, I'm Mary McComas, Executive Director of Academics. Uh, Ms. Miller, there's four uh, main categories that services are provided for students in any community school. Um, one of the key ones is expanded learning opportunities, and that includes um, before, during, and after school uh, supports, as well as extended day, extended school year supports that would involve tutoring support. Um, in addition, they have mentoring for students, conflict resolution. Um, leadership opportunities. It looks to provide a well-rounded um, enrichment program for students that participate. Additionally, as um, Mr. Stewart mentioned earlier, the health and mental services, wraparound services that are provided, not just for the students, but for the families as well. Family and community engagement helps uh, connect uh, families to resources that they may need. It may be food banks. It really depends on what the families need, but the community coordinator uh, works to find all the resources available in a community to support a family holistically uh, that needs it. And then early childhood development for those situations that, uh, those schools that have early childhood needs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and is there any kind of, uh, I guess, milestones that are set for this? Yes, yeah, so there is a, um, a multiple measure that you look at in terms of uh, assessing the success of a community school program. <coughs> Oftentimes uh, that is measured in terms of a reduction in chronic absenteeism at a school, an increase in attendance rate, an increase in student achievement, as well as um, measuring the number of community resources that are accessed through the program. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion about uh, the contracts that are to be approved? If not, um, I would ask all those in favor of approving the contracts M1 through M4, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries, Ms. Decker. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. You're welcome. <coughs> The next agenda item is new business, the IB Magnet Program at Stemmers Run Middle School, and for that I'll call forward Mrs. White. You've changed, Mrs. White. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Uh, tonight we're requesting your approval to designate Stemmers Run Middle School as a magnet school. So Mr. Embrielli and Ms. Sh uh, Mrs. Schubert are here to walk you through how we've uh, come to this recommendation and to an answer any questions that you have. But this is in alignment with policy 6400. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. White. I also wanted to mention that Mr. Tanner, the principal of Stemmers Run, is also here as well. Uh, so the, this is in alignment, as Ms. White said, with the Magnet Task Force. So it's requested that Stemmers Run Middle be approved as a new middle school magnet offering site. The magnet program will begin as an international studies program for the 2017-18 school year as the school undergoes the international baccalaureate certification process. And then the IB program at Stemmers Run Middle School will eventually provide a clear pathway to students to Kenwood High School, where there is already an existing IB program. And at this time, we'll take any questions that you might have. Uh, yes, go ahead, Mr. I, I don't, oh. I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, that this is happening, uh, but I, did I hear earlier in a previous meeting that we talked something about doing this also at Middle River, or did I miss that? So Middle River is part of our Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant that the school system submitted back in June. We've not yet heard about that grant application. Ah. We're anticipating an award notice by the end of September. So this is separate from that grant application. Uh, uh, was that also going to be, I thought I understood that was going to also be uh, about the IB program. 
So it, you are, if it comes through, is that accurate? You are correct. That is oh, part good. of the grant application. Good. That's that's huge for our community, uh, and um, and I've been familiar uh, with the IB program, although I had already retired before it started at Kenwood. But back in those days, they had an IV um, an IB advisory board made up of community members, and I was asked to be on it. And um, it's just it's just a great program, and. Um, it's really wonderful to have that in our area where a lot of children don't really understand um, their potential. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just am very enthusiastic about it. I would, I would emphasize to, to you and to uh, everyone involved that uh, it is critical which teachers are the coordinators of the program. Because in the history of the program at Kenwood, I know in the time I was on the IB board, they, they subsequently dismantled that board and don't have a citizen's advisory board anymore, which is another, another conversation for another time. But the enthusiasm and the dedication of the coordinators is really critical to the success of the program. And um, I'm only familiar with the IB program at Kenwood, but I know uh, that that to be the case. So I would encourage vigilance and really getting some of our many, many stars to, to lead that those programs up. But it's just it's a wonderful thing for the Essex Middle River community. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Uh, Ms. Causey. Hi, Mr. Imbriali. Could you just explain a little bit about what is the certification process? Yes, it's a multiple year process. And so in the first year, you're not considered IB at all. And so that's why we call the program an international studies program. And then, it, and then the school has to go through a whole series of certification processes that takes a number of years. Uh, the school is well aware of what that process looks like. Uh, the principal, Mr. Tanner, talked to the PTA at the school, so the parents are well aware. Uh, Ms. Schubert, can you explain in a little more detail about what that process looks like? Sure. Part of the certification process with IB involves the school really developing their emphasis for global studies. There's been many different lenses that a school, a middle years program school can take. Once that lens is established in that application process, teachers will then um, work to take our existing BCPS curriculum and identify where there are natural fits to that lens. So I'll use an example of global ecology, and that's really just hypothetical in this situation. But teachers would look throughout that middle years program and look at our existing curriculum and see where are their natural connections where we can help to grow that IB lens for all of our students. IB then comes in and looks at that work over the course of several years to ensure that we're following the program of study identified IB and that the work we're accomplishing aligns with their goals as well. So could you just give me a little background on Kenwood High School, how long they've been in IB certified and how many students have been successful in that program so that we can see, like Senator Collins said, the, the, the real benefits of this program. So the exact years I'd have to get back to you on how long that program has been in place. Um, I will tell you that the program at Kenwood has struggled quite a bit. And one of the reasons for looking at the IB middle years program is to create this natural feeder. Mm. So preparing students in that middle years opportunity. At the high school level and what's in place at um, Kenwood High School, the ninth and 10th grade experience is actually an extension of the middle years program. And then in 11th and 12th grade, students would enter into that diploma-bound program. So with the establishment of STEMERS Run, and then hopefully with the grant award, with the establishment at the program at Middle River, um, we would have the ability to really create a strong foundation for students that would then feed into Kenwood High School. But Kenwood is certified. Correct. IB. Ken Kenwood is a, an IB diploma-bound program, so grades 11 and 12. And we do have students that graduate from there with that diploma. I mean, uh, our former Big SMOB. Sure, yeah. That's you correct. Did correct. That and and mm -hmm. she wasn't alone. I mean, correct. <laughs> she had a number of peers that did that. Do you know what number? I don't, I don't know that data off the top of my head, but it's certainly something I can get. Okay, because it was encouraging um, from Deeks' perspective and certainly Senator Collins, so thank you. Kathleen, I think it's, um, I retired in 92, and it was shortly thereafter that it started uh, so, uh, at Kenwood. I don't, know, I don't know the exact year. <clears throat> Thank you. But it, but it has had its ups and downs, and a lot of that, um, I think this, which makes this so important, a lot of that was because some of the, some of the coordinators were very aggressive 
in, in, in promoting it and going down to the middle schools and uh, doing a lot of outreach, and others were not, and, um, and, and that had a lot to do with it. So having this natural feeder program, I know I don't have to convince you on this, but, but having this natural feeder program I think will bear a great deal of, a great deal of fruit. I, I'm certainly hopeful. Ms. Miller? Is there any impact um, with starting it in the middle school as far as kids who might not qualify until later years in high school or, or would they need to qualify in middle school in order to be fed into it in high school? I'm not sure. I, I think I understand what you're asking. No, students, it's a whole school program. So all students who are zoned for Stemmers Run are part of the middle years program um, if it's approved by this board. Other students can apply, like our regular magnet programs, to enter STEMers and be part of the middle years program through the International Baccarat program. Students can also, um, going into ninth grade, apply to attend the Kenwood program, not having attended the middle years program. So it doesn't exclude students from that program. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions for the panel? If not, I would ask if there's a motion to approve item N. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of approving item N, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. We have another item of new business, uh, a report on the FY18 state capital budget. And for that, uh, call forth Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, this is uh, a report which provides uh, the uh, state capital budget request uh, that once approved will be <coughs> submitted uh, for review by the uh, IAC Committee of the Board of Public Works. Um, and ultimately form the basis of the FY18 uh, capital budget to be adopted by the legislature next spring. Uh, the process has been that after introduction uh, during the first meeting in August, we'll have a work session uh, to take questions and discuss the various projects in detail. This year we have an additional work session so that there will be two, August 23rd and August 30th. And uh, we ask that if you have questions in advance, they be submitted to the staff through Ms. Decker and uh, we'll be prepared to answer those and any other questions on the 23rd and the 30th. Thank Very you. good. Well, thank you for giving us this advanced uh, notice. And um, as Mr. Sarah said, we have a couple meetings. And, uh, and as Ms. Causey has often done, I think the earlier we get questions to the group, uh, gives them time to come prepared, and we'll have a, a more efficient discussions on the 23rd and the 30th. Uh, so we'll be prepared to do that. Yes, Ms. Causey. Mr. Chair, is there an opportunity in this cycle for community input on the capital construction? We, we will have a hearing, don't we? We usually have a hearing. We had a public hearing in May, um, right. and this is these next two meetings are board work sessions. They're conducted in public, but the public <clears throat> does not pose questions at that time. Okay, so if, so if any community member or stakeholder wanted to also look at this online and provide and and ask questions they can just get them to a board member and we can fold that into our questions and discussions i oh, think that's, that's best case scenario yeah okay yeah. and and um i also have had already submitted questions in an uh, email following up on the uh, current capital construction plan um that i emailed to uh Dr. Dance and Mr. Smith today, so I'm a little bit ahead of the curve, but um, that sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So we will be getting those uh, questions to you, so we'll be prepared uh, at our next meeting to go through the details. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
All right. Um, our next agenda item is public comment on policies, and we have a number of them to uh, get through tonight. Our first policy is policy 1280, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Ferrone and Marion Moore uh, signed up. So uh, at this time, uh, Dr. Ferrone, you're first up. And um, Dr. Ferrone, I'll give you the same option. I'm sorry. Well, I'll give you, if you want to do yours together uh, or separately, whatever you're comfortable doing. I see you've signed up for all the policies, whichever you'd like to uh, yeah, do. I'd rather talk to them all at the same time. Okay, well, I'd like you to do it first then, if you would uh, do that. And so the, the, do you need me to read them out or do you have them all in order? Uh, I have him in the same Okay, order. all right, go ahead. Thank you all for allowing me to speak to you. I take it seriously. And <coughs> if I'm allowed to be an active member in the PRC, I would not really speak to you, just an idea. Okay, uh, policy number um, 1280 uh, about, excuse me. about community relations. Uh, as I stated in previous uh, uh, comments, I request that the word efficient use of school to be defined. Uh, in the second item under IB or 1B, it says recognizes the importance of community involvement. Uh, recommend to you to use the word engagement. Involvement is softer than engagement, and sitting, listening to the board, I think you want engagement with the public. And the last but not really least, no, I think that's, that's all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next policy is 5250 on graduation requirements. It's 1300. Uh, 1300 I'm on sorry. my. Okay. He spoke on 13. Why not? He did. 1300? Yes, 1300. Okay. So, policy 1300 about community relations and school of facilities, the use of facilities of the school. Uh, and their philosophy, number one. Item A, my recommendation is to allow the use of school facilities for commercial or business reasons and to generate revenue from that in the form of fees. This is not the same asking the school system to make revenues like taxes. It is about fees. would be the same if I asked the school system to give me a copy of the past 10 years of, of anything I have to pay for every page. And I think that would be uh, uh, towards a good use for the school system. The second item under uh, number three guidelines, um, if those who use the facilities cause damage, then I think there needs to be in the policy um, an implication to how much money they would pay. And that would be used uh, towards uh, not only the repairs. I think just leaving it are uh, not unduly damaged is just really vague. So um, mm. to one would be meaning something and to another means something else. And uh, the last one that I have a question about I really couldn't understand, it might be because I'm born somewhere else, is item B. Um, school facilities for community purposes be viewed as a mechanism for keeping the school open. I'm not really sure exactly what that means, you know. Um, so, um, and next one is uh, still 1300. It's an item D is approve, reject, or revoke any application, recommend that we add for a justifiable, reasonable cause. Okay. 
last but not least, under item D number five, facil school facilities violates any board policy, superintendent rule, or any rules and regulations concerning the use of the school facilities. So just add in the word violating county, comma, state, comma, federal laws or rules. That's the end of my comments about policy 1300. Thank you, Dr. Farron. The next one is 5250 uh, graduation requirements. 5250 about students retention graduation requirement. Again, briefly, um, item number one, A, uh, talks about uh, graduation from high school. The board is dedicated to ensuring that it is graduates are college and career ready. And then it talks about reaching their potential as responsible, productive citizens. Uh, my thought is to add also the word ethical, because the school system is really what brings the new generations. And if we look at our life, everyday life, ethics are really important for doing the right thing. Um, and the, last, uh, and the uh, next line suggests adding uh, to meet the diverse needs, ap aptitudes, uh, adding the words cultural, scientific, math, literally, and ethical needs of future graduates. Again, to basically focus and stress that it's not about just math and science. It's about making a whole student that become an excellent citizen in the future. Um, item number two under standards. Item number A. Uh, basically, the requirement for graduation is according, in accordance with, comma, the bylaws of Maryland State Board of Education. Suggest so adding or higher. In essence, we follow the standards by MSDE, but we can go higher than that. And I also recommend the Department of Education also rules, because basically it's not really MSDE, but also what the federal level is um, directing the old school systems um, to um, ascend to or improve to. That's the end of my comments on 5250. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Uh, the next one is 5520. Uh, conduct student address code. Okay, this one is a difficult policy and I only request that the board member and the public would be open mind about it. In that policy about the dress code number one, it talks about the board believe that the dress and appearance should not interfere with any aspect of educational process. I think this is subjective in nature and can be misused or misunderstood. My comment about the dress of our students, including my kids when they went to school, that private schools I really think is better dealing with that issue than public schools. I think being conservative in the dress is important for raising a generation that know how to behave when they go to college. And it is not blaming the victim, it is really teaching the victims that being conservative in the dress would go away positive in preventing problems in the future when they go to college and would prevent also distractions in the school system. That's the end of my comment about the dress code. Thank you. The uh, next policy is 5561. Uh, I have 5530. Right. 5530, okay. okay. 5530 policy is about tobacco. Correct. And 
my request is for the board to consider in that policy to declare that all Baltimore County public school campuses to be tobacco free, alcohol free, drug free. And that of course will include electronic cigarettes and so forth. I think just really focusing on tobacco is not really enough. Uh, there are far more problems with alcohol than tobacco, although if you add both of them, it would be even more serious health-wise. And of course, if you add um, the um, uh, drugs to it, it's even more serious. Um, the item under standards, uh, and I may be wrong about that, basically talk about the students uh, only. And I wonder if there is any separate policy for employees. I think the same thing should be for employees too. Uh, the school system needs to have signs like we see in commercial buildings, government buildings, hospitals, that on the door BCPS is drug free, tobacco free, et cetera. And last but not least, it's about money. We always need money. Those who violate that policy needs to know that they would be cited and they have to pay fines for that. And that fine will go towards some educational programs, will go for something really positive, just like police stopping a driver and giving a citation, having to pay the money for it. That's the end of my comments about 5530. Thank you. The next one is 5561, then the uh, um, school use of reportable offenses. Um, this policy, Mr. Chair, board members, um, my concern <coughs> about it is that there might be abuse of the use of reportable offense. So my thought about that is that if a student is arrested and that have been reported and used against the student, still the student is innocent until proven otherwise. So to me, it really starts that process that um, sometimes often described as a pipeline between the school system and prisons for certain segments of, of society. Um, so my thought about that is that the policy needs to affirm that even a person is arrested, that that person is um, innocent until proven otherwise. And um, rehabilitation might be a better issue than making that reportable offense against the student. I know we don't have enough counselors in the school system, and I take this opportunity to focus on counseling rather than on the legal aspect of the arrest of the students, because it really does change their life, you know, for a very, very long time. That's the end of my comment on 5561. Thank you. And the last one is the uh, gifted and talented 6401 policy. 6401. Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, yeah, <clears throat> can I? We, yeah, send back. we can hear discussion, obviously it's the board's pleasure. Um, I would strongly recommend if there are numerous persons who wanna speak on 6401 that they submit their um, concerns in writing um, because that policy as the superintendent has indicated is definitely coming back to PRC and I can personally say that I have read the emails that have come in and I'm going to um, be asking that staff compile all of the written material for all, all of PRC members so that we can, when we get back to that policy, we will review all of the various comments and address them. I just don't, you know, I don't want it to be piecemeal with different conversations, I'd rather have them in writing and before PRC so that, you know, all of the concerns are in fact considered. I, obviously, I, I can't stop people from talking tonight, but what I am saying as chair of PRC, speaking personally, 
it would be much more meaningful if you continue to submit your concerns in writing. And as I said, I'm going to be asking Michelle if you, Debbie, if you will make sure that PRC has a complete composite of all of the written emails that have come in uh, concerning these um, matters. I, with I agree with you. And Thank I really you. intended to do that. Um, however, with my work and I, mean, I, understand. I have the email, it's, it just understand. doesn't go through. Um, so in this policy 6401, uh, students and item A on top of the page, students, regardless of their race, comma, ethnicity, comma, gender, comma, socioeconomic status, geographical location, language, disability, I recommend that we add religious belief and sexual orientation. Religious belief is obviously why I ask for that. Sexual orientation with LGBT community, many businesses are um, coming forward and addressing that head on and adding it. Um, and one, one last word about the policy and I'll wrap it real quick about the name. I really like the name Academic, Advanced Academics, because with the gifted and talented name, I think every student, no matter what disability or smartness they have, they are gifted and talented in a way. Um, among my three sons, um, you know, one of them is really gifted and talented in music and have a difficulty with emotions, difficulty with things that you can't really feel. Um, a person can be gifted and talented in, in uh, uh, literature, but not really in science and math. So the name, I think, is really a modern name. It's, a, it's applicable for today, and I hope that you would adopt that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farron. Now, Ms. Moore, I know you've signed up for five of the policies. Would you like to do them more individually or together? Which would you? Well, I've matured over the past couple of months, and I think that I would like to do it individually to consider the time of the speakers tonight. Okay, thank you. Well, the um, first policy, thank you, is um, 1280 on boundary changes. Then that's the first one, too. Okay. Tonight, I would like to point out the policy analysis section uh, when being reviewed by the PRC. I noticed that there was a section called cost analysis and fiscal impact on the school system. Um, this is a, a general comment that applies to really all of the um, policies, uh, but I'll try to, you know, point out some things about 1280 as well. Typically under this section, it states no fiscal impact <coughs> is anticipated. However, there is a cost associated for every law created. So my question regarding transparency is, where are the documents or cases related to your policies that have had a fiscal impact on the school system? This fiscal information should be included in your policies because most of them have cost-related data if the policies are either violated or, or appealed or if there was an incident related to the policy. Therefore, I am requesting to add a cost uh, and benefits analysis section to each policy in order to keep track of how cost-effective your decisions uh, or your employees' decisions are. For example, with this initiative, you could determine how much money you save by involving the community with decision making in terms of boundary changes. Thus, demonstrating how your attention, um, how attentive you are to your public uh, public's concern, may you know create benefits. Um, more benefits than costs through effective teamwork. Involving the community with reviewing trends regarding equity, boundary changes, or the fiscal details that are being neglected or supported could and should have a positive impact on your annual budget. 
It could also help reduce the amount of legal cases you have to participate, um, you have uh, each year regarding students, employees, equity, zoning, or boundary changes. Lastly, providing the public with an interactive policy that includes a cost and benefits analysis for each policy with infographs show evidence of policy implementation um, such as the the progress in reducing caseloads per policy or identifying cases, oh, I'll skip that because I only have 20 seconds, but um, when you're promoting progress and transparency with problems and fairness with your cases, um, this is you know great for the public to see. And when you integrate that with your Blueprint 2.0 performance report, it shows how your policies and your, um, and your strategic plan are. Um Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, policy to be discussed is policy 1300, use of school facilities. That's it, you're up for that. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and the superintendent's rule 1300, section H number 12, um, you may have it. Uh, around you, I'm not sure, but it states proposed activities must be open to all individuals and not discriminate in any way. It should still be on. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, in any way on the basis of age, disability, ethnicity, race, or religion. Therefore, I suggest that Rule 1300, um, Form A, be modified to add those protected groups of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, including other demographics or affiliations that could be discriminated against. In addition, I request that the application process be electronic in order for employees or applicants to efficiently submit forms with options to upload permits, certificates, and legal documentation. I noticed that there was a PDF that could be filled out, um, the you know form A, but I'm not sure if there's an online application process where applicants could submit conveniently 24-7. Also, when citizens uh, file a complaint and appeal or if uh, there was an incident that happened at the facility, um, this online feature could have options to upload pictures, video from the incidents or the final condition of the facility. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Adele. But um, m moreover, having an online application um, feature reduces the chances of discrimination. It will have a time stamp on what groups are applying for facility usage, so an administrator or other employees will not be able to arbitrarily choose who has the privilege to use the facility, reducing the chances of appeal cases. Uh, lastly, my overall request uh, on this policy supports goal four, organizational effectiveness, letter, letter B, build, sustain, and invest in technology infrastructure in efforts to streamline data management and create efficiencies through the organization. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, the next policy um, to be discussed is 5250, graduation requirements, and you've signed up for that one. As an African-American mother of an African-American male, I have many concerns about what a graduation diploma symbolizes or requires. With systems such as bureaucracy and institutional racism, my son or future daughter is not guaranteed a job. Presently, there are African-Americans who find it difficult to acquire jobs, even after investing their time and money in obtaining multiple degrees. So what does your school system consistently provide students to ensure job security or a secure future through entrepreneurship? Teaching business ed under the career and technology department exposed me to many vital college and career ready initiatives that made my students more marketable. Therefore, I believe the implementation of this policy should reflect the marketability <coughs> of your students, not necessarily the marketability of your school system. Promoting the increase of your annual graduation rate is good, but what true value does a diploma hold? Therefore, I believe that high school graduation requirements should include and if you would like to take some Cornell notes, 
Uh, I'm going to read down a bullet tip list. Uh, Microsoft Office Specialist Certification by the ninth grade. Certifications in at least two computer programming languages. Financial Literacy Certification. An option to take a CLEP exam, which is through College Board that allows students to uh, test out of classes and, uh, for college, saving them money and time. Cultural competence and diversity training certificates. Experience in a trade for at least two years. In-house internships. I believe each school and department should have an intern to support the superintendent's efforts to have a system-wide mentoring program. All graduates should have an organized career portfolio that includes writing samples, resumes, cover letters, and work samples. All graduates should be required to take an uh, entrepreneurship and business courses. There should be a civil literacy requirement that gives students an option to take a course at school or online on a specific legal area, corporate, criminal, family, environmental law. In closing, the graduation rate is just quantitative data. But ensuring my child has job security or is prepared for entrepreneurship, despite his race, is important to me. So what is your school system doing to add more value to the uh, graduation, to the graduation uh, requirements uh, for your next term, Dr. Dance? So my quote, my ending quote is to whom much is given, much is required. Um, you have a lot of work to do, <coughs> but if you hashtag compete with purpose and hire a teammate who could save you money, time, and energy with your Thank you, uh, Ms. Moore. Um, our next policy up is 5520, and Mr. David Green has actually signed up next for that public comment. Didn't I sign up for 5520 is the next one. 5250. But, um. Well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll get my paperwork. Yes. No, I don't have you signed up for 5250. Okay, I'll skip that one then. All right. Um, 5520 is uh, student dress code, Mr. Green. Oh, I signed up for the wrong one. Well, I go, if you wanted to speak on, did you want to speak on the uh, 5250 graduation requirements? Sure. Um, All right. Sorry. Um, one of the beauties of the English language is concision. Um, I found if you go to the hardware store and buy uh, a new tool or whatever, the instructions are generally longer in the other language. And one of my suggestions to folks on the PRC are that whenever you make a policy change, that you try to make it concise and also clear. And as an example, I could, I could have picked almost any policy uh, to make this comment on. Um, but uh, the, the goal that you set for 5250, which is uh, graduation requirements, was uh, alignment with current goals. Um, this policy, actually, before you changed it, aligned with current goals, and all you did was change the buzzword. So you didn't really improve that goal, but you actually were worse in clarity and concision. And this is important because if you send an email to a dozen people or 20 or 100 or 1,000, it really pays off if you make it con concise and you don't waste people's time. All these policies are reviewed by a lot of people and they're read by a lot of people and it's important that they understand them. Some examples, uh, your, you cat your categorization of this is you change from the, the section to, from philosophy to policy statement. Philosophy is pretty clear. Uh, you used an, another, an extra word and more letters to call it a policy statement section. The whole document is a policy statement, so you just fuzz things up a little bit just with your how you categorize the sections. Um, the, the, the thrust of this uh, in section A, the thrust of it is the board is dedicated to ensuring that its graduates are prepared to enter post-secondary education and employment. So you added the buzzwords, college and career ready, but you didn't add any new meaning there. Um, if you go down to implementation section three, 
you, it says the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. Are there any policies where you tell the superintendent to ignore the policy and not implement it? Um, if I followed your approach here, I would have signed up for every one of these uh, comments, just as Dr. Ferrone said, and said, please cut out number three. It should be assumed and write it up in the in introductory paragraph to all your policies that the superintendent's going to implement it. So um, I just uh, want you to pay attention to these policies. They're important, as Ann has pointed out, Ms. Miller, uh, this is one of your most important jobs. And please do it so we can understand what you're saying and review them in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Our next policy to be reviewed is 5561, uh, school use of reportable offenses. And Ms. Moore, you're uh, next up for that. Every month, we hear about an African-American child, teen, or adult, dreams being killed, or life path being altered through the criminal justice system, and sometimes the education system. The most we can do as education leaders is to create more opportunities for students to live out their dreams. Often we allow stereotypes and prejudice to guide our decisions, not giving students or adults of certain races or social groups a chance to progress beyond their mistakes. On the other hand, there are privileged people who make mistakes every day and are given chances to continue to lead without much consequence. So how can we create a privileged system for the underprivileged? How can we have some compassion and urgency for students, even if they are not in your social or racial group or live in your neighborhood? Often students who are involved in gangs or crimes are treated as a problem when we should be actively developing an innovative treatment plan. Most treatment plans involve neglect, isolation, zero tolerance policies, or harsh disciplinary practices that further impact the student's record of life. So here are a few questions and recommendations for the superintendent when he receives notice that a student has been arrested for a crime. Determine whether the student committed the crime while he or she was suspended from school. Was the reported offense related to bullying and harassment in school? Immediately uh, meet with parents, teachers, and counselors to find out the interests of the student, to develop a personalized plan for the student. Creative solutions could be vocational training, visual liter literary or performing arts therapy, tutoring services, mentoring, substance abuse counseling, and a social worker to address financial issues, financial and health matters, or career options. Perhaps the local police department could initiate a program to counter the school to prison pipeline by using technology and media to allow inmates to have a Skype session with students or produce informational videos to students as a prison prevention program. Create a student advisory who represent a demographic of students who do not get straight A's, who do not have perfect attendance or a clean record and allow these students to help you lead. I'm sure they can tell you what you could do to improve the school system. My final questions are, since you've been superintendent, have there been any policy changes or improvements in how black or Hispanic students have been treated for offenses in relation to white students? And have suspensions or arrests changed for those racial groups? Thank you, Ms. Moore. Um, our next speaker is David Green on um, policy 55, Okay, thank you, Mr. Green. All right, now we're at um, our policy 6401. Those that signed up that are still here. Karen Cirillo. Good evening. Yes, hi, I am Karen Cirillo. Um, tonight I come here as a proud mom of two BCPS alumni. My son next week will be a sophomore at Harvard. Mm. My daughter last year graduated from Georgetown University and she is now working on her master's degree. BCPS has done well for our family, thank you very much. 
but it wasn't always easy, especially in the beginning because of my kids' giftedness. Now, um, Ms. Williams um, left, and I, I have to say I was about to, oh, there. she's there, okay. I was going to um, cede my, my time uh, in anticipation of uh, continued work on 6401. Dr. Dance, we can't thank you enough for the announcement you made earlier in the evening that you and Ms. Williams are going to um, work more on the wording. Um, but I came here to talk about the wording and I was going to see my time, um, but I feel that I need to have you hear a different view than Dr. Farone gave you about the wording of the policy. Um, I have two quick examples for you tonight about why the wording of the policy, why the word gifted is important. And these are just two examples, um, but there are others that continue to happen. So hopefully this is just a head note for our continued work together on the wording. See, the word gifted means something. Uh, and it means something different from advanced academics because gifted is more than just academics. Giftedness is more than just what is learned in the classroom. It also includes social and emotional and behavioral differences that gifted people demonstrate. Gifted students are present in all of our populations and they all deserve to be understood and served properly. And without this recognition, they, we can't serve them. Quick example, when my daughter was young, um, we knew she was smart, we even used the word gifted, but she had some behaviors that puzzled us. She was aggressive, uh, she had an unhealthy perfectionism, she was argumentative, um, and it wasn't until I learned that gifted and talented education is a whole subset unto itself, and that the word giftedness has more meaning than just academics that I understood her and was able to partner with the school better. My second example, believe it or not, is I had a friend who had a second grader in a BCPS elementary school whose principal and nurse told him to get the kid on ADHD medication or get him out of the school. He had tests done, he, wasn't, he didn't have ADHD, he was a gifted child. When they put him with a different teacher, he did better. So the word brunette means something about hair color. The word diabetic means something about blood condition, the word giftedness means something. And the concept of a new term of art is, is not a good thing because giftedness is also used in federal law, in Maryland law, and in thousands of pages of research and, and educational writing. So I look forward to working with you all on the changes in the wording. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cirillo. Our next speaker is Alexandria Barankina. She's not here. Okay, uh, Ms. Rabarczyk, I think I see you still here. Thank you for your comments. After listening to the other comments tonight on this policy and the fact that it's being rewritten, I will be sure to send an email with more thought Wonderful. than just what I wrote this afternoon. Um, however, I do agree that what you've got is a semantics problem here. However, it's not quite as bad as everyone thinks. Gifted and talented is your student. Advanced academics is what you are offering them. And I think if you can make clear that difference, you'll use a lot of the fears of your gifted and talented parents and students in your system. Um, gifted and talented, like the speaker before me said, I apologize for forgetting your name. Um, is legalese. It's been put into a lot of federal and state and local laws. And so changing that nom, um, the, those words might be difficult and it also well, might cause your system problems. However, I think it's important that you distinguish between the two. Because, for example, my son Stephen is gifted and talented in science and math. His little brother is gifted in math and language arts, but not so much in science. So you've got two gifted and talented kids with very different advanced academic focuses. And that can be difficult for the teachers to handle, that can be difficult for the parents to handle, and unfortunately it can be difficult for the students to handle if that's not recognized. One of the problems my older son had in middle school was that because he was identified as GNT, he was put in an entire spectrum of mm. GNT classes. Needless to say, his English language arts classes and history classes were a huge struggle. Um, now that I've gotten his high school schedule, I'm very, very happy to see that he's been put in honors English 
and um, honors history, he's still in the GNT math and science. His schedule has been specialized to his abilities and to his particular giftedness. And I think that is a very wonderful thing to see, and I hope that's a continuing trend for our students, because I think that will better help them develop and be ready for what their particular strengths are and be able to take those out into the world after they graduate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis King. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. I've been here since my son was in the second grade. He's one of Miss Bratt's classmates. One more year, you're stuck <laughs> with me. I am going to avail myself the opportunity to uh, send my comments to my old classmate, Miss Williams, and uh, <laughs> leave it at that. Uh, the last speaker stole pretty much everything I was going to say anyway, so thank you. <laughs> Very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, Miss Moore, you're next up on uh, policy 6401. Um, I was just kind of taking notes of what some of the speakers were saying, so I just wanted to, I guess, throw a word out there. Um, someone said that language is really important. GT is the student. Advanced academics is what you're offering them. The wording. Although someone was placed in GT, or, or wasn't placed in DGT classes, the teacher can make a difference. He didn't have H ADHD, he was gifted. And we have to identify what student strengths are. Separate but equal, that's, that's what I have to say. Separate but equal, let's think about that. Separate but equal, GT. My focus for policy 6401 will be on advanced academics for African Americans. I know your entire population is not African American, but I'm using my race as a model that you could apply to your diverse population. First, as education leaders, we must embrace the many races, religions, and cultures of our students and allow them to have more cultural academic options. For example, we have to find ways to integrate African heritage of African Americans within our curriculum, the truth. So advanced academics in America is not providing African Americans with history curriculum that is biased by providing, uh, but providing more course offerings regarding the dynastic rule of ancient Africa and promote that Africans were very advanced and civilized people, not just slaves, people without power, intellect, or class. Additionally, collaborating with historically black colleges such as Morgan State or Howard University to offer African studies online for your students is vital to your social studies department partnerships. When African American students learn about their beautiful and dynamic history, it gives them pride in who they truly are, positively influencing them to perform well and see themselves as leaders. Next, we must have a more diverse workforce or diverse partnerships within the teaching industry, especially in schools with predominantly bl a black uh, population. How can we recruit and retain more professionals to partner with the school system to demonstrate diversity? I recommend more, uh, lastly, more project and performance-based assessments for African Americans. A linear or standardized test format will not do them justice. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Julie miller breitz Hello, everyone. Thank you for bearing with me one more time on Policy 6401. <laughs> Uh, I would like to share the specific recommendations of the GTCAC advisory group as it relates to the proposed policy. Uh, firstly, we believe the title of the policy should, in in should incorporate the term gifted and talented. So again, I want to uh, echo Karen's sentiment. Thank you for um, saying that that is definitely going to be looked at. Uh, we believe that in Section 1B of the proposed policy, the definition of a gifted and talented student as defined in Section 8201 of the Annotated Code of Maryland 
Incorporated. We also believe that rather than just listing achievement as the sole measure of giftedness, reference to ability and potential must also be used as it is called for in Comar. Um, we have 13A.04.07.02C. .04 .07 .02 C. Research clearly indicates that using only the measure of high achievement excludes many student populations like ELL farms or twice exceptional learners. Uh, in Section 2A, as currently written, it is not in compliance with COMAR 13A.04.07.03A. .04 .07 .03A. The proposed policy currently is written to say that all students will have access to advanced academics. If that is the case, then BCPS cannot claim that it is providing different services for gifted and talented students as is required by COMAR. Additionally, we believe Section 2A is where a reference to how the district identifies students for access to the programs is logically inserted. Uh, in other words, make section 2A be where they need to identify the child, where the need to identify the child is discussed, and then make section 2B where the enrichment and acceleration options for all students, as well as the distinct specialized programs available to all gifted, to the gifted and talented student is discussed. Uh, in section 3A, as is currently written, says the superintendent is responsible for establishing a process for student referral and participation in advanced academics. This places the focus on the advanced academics model or program rather than on the student and how he or she is identified as COMAR 13A.04.07.02D requires. We believe this would be more this would more appropriately read, the superintendent shall establish a process for identifying students for referral and participation in the advanced academics GT program and then go on to detail the process. Uh, we appreciate that Section 3B has a measure of accountability to it. We believe it needs to go further by requiring an annual evaluation and report on the gifted and talented population by providing disaggregated data about their identification, participation, retention, and assessment of growth levels and um, making a commitment that the data is easily available to all stakeholders. Uh, statute and regulation require that both the identification process and the effectiveness of the program and services to GT students is provided. Um, currently, there is no provision in proposed policy 6401 that relates to professional development for teachers who teach gifted and talented students, which is also required in COMAR, uh, and we believe this should be added to the policy. Um, so we're just asking that the timeline for the revision of the policy 6401 Thank you. Thank you for reading very quickly. <laughs> and I, I, I will make sure you guys have a copy of this if you don't already. Great. Our next speaker is uh, Yvonne Golscheski. Hello. I am Hello. Yvonne Kolcheski, and I am president of the Maryland Coalition for Gifted and Talented Education, an affiliate of the National Association for Gifted Children. Um, I represent um, the families of all gifted and talented learners in the state, including those here in Baltimore County. And I echo, echo the earlier thank yous for revisiting the policy. Um, however, I feel it's still important to state our position for the record. Um, it is our belief that the language in your current draft violates COMAR 13A.0407 in relation to Section 2A under identification as well as 3A programs and services. In addition to the lo local districts that the policy references are in no way model districts for gifted and talented. We encourage you to look instead to counties such as Prince George's County, which has the greatest number of excellence in gifted and talented education education schools. They've won the most awards in the state as well as other districts like Howard County that have a long-standing and successful K-12 through GT program and a commitment to GT staffing and funding. When the 2012 GT Comar was approved, many local districts began to work to improve identification, teacher training, program evaluation and services in order to become compliant by 2017. Some districts, like Harford County, ended their school-wide enrichment model and terminology because it focused on the identification of services or curriculum instead of on individual gifted and talented learners. This was a move toward COMAR regulations. It seems that BCPS is actually going backwards by eliminating GT identification and language. The term gifted and talented describes students with a specific set of academic, social, and emotional traits. GT services are not a reward for kids who behave well in class and, in, and turn in perfect work. 
Rather, they are an academic necessity for children who learn differently and who are, by definition, significantly different from the norm. Gifted and talented students are considered an at-risk group and are the greatest group of underachievers in our public schools. Some researchers even state that as many as 20% of our dropouts are gifted. And I can personally attest that I know some. In the current policy draft, language seems to indicate that only high achievers will be recognized at BCPS. Um, this will put these GT students at even greater risk, especially underrepresented groups such as English language learners and low-income gifted learners. While they are a diverse group, the term gifted and talented helps educators understand certain behaviors, traits, and characteristics displayed by these students. Knowing which students have been identified helps to ensure their needs will be met and calls for accountability. Students may not fall under special education law, however, they are a special needs recognized by the Council for Exceptional Children and the National PTA. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Jason Dow. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good to see you again. Um, I did send an email this afternoon to the Policy Review Committee and in turn forwarded it to the rest of the board. Uh, I don't really know how to follow all that up. <laughs> I agree with a lot of what everybody said. Um, but I do encourage the Policy Review Committee to at least include the term giftedness in the policy. It doesn't really particularly matter to me if we call it advanced academics or whatever you want to call it. But I think the policy does need to include the children that we're addressing, which are gifted and talented students. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we do uh, appreciate all the comments. And as Ms. Williams said, we're going to take those under advisement and come back to the full board with uh, a modified policy of some sort. So thank you very much. Um, our next uh, agenda item uh, is board committee updates. Uh, we haven't had uh, many meetings since our last uh, session, but at this time um, I'll go around. I know Ms. Miller has uh, some comments for um, a committee update. Yes, uh, I just have a brief update on the Safety and Technology Committee, which I refer to as the SIT Committee. Um, in March, the board charged uh, two board members to work with the central office staff on issues around safety and technology. Uh, at our first meeting in June, uh, Mr. Gillis and I um, attended and uh, I requested to bring in a data security expert to uh, speak with the uh, SIT committee in a separate meeting to articulate the concerns around the issues of students bringing the devices home. Um, because I'm not able really to articulate those concerns very well uh, myself. So um, Chairman Ferlita White agreed to that and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, they met last night. I'm really looking forward to getting an update on that meeting, but I did speak at length with my contact, the data security expert, and he reported to me that he met with um, Lloyd Brown and I believe it was Ryan Imbriali. Uh, I wish they were here because I really wanted to thank them. He uh, expressed to me that they were very open. Um, he was able to really list out his concerns, um, even give some recommendations. Uh, it was a good two-way communication. Um, so I'm very encouraged by that meeting, and I really want to thank the committee and, and also Ms. White for arranging that meeting and allowing that. Um, you know, if it continues that way, and I have no reason to think that it won't, I will be singing your praises. So uh, I wanted to share that with the board and the public and um, let you know I'm very, uh, very encouraged by um, what's happening so far. Um, let me see, what else did I want to say? 
I mean, obviously, this is a monumental task. It's something that you can never completely uh, eliminate the risk, and the risks are always changing. So uh, that's why this is so important. And um, I would like to see us meet monthly, but so long as we have progress, I'm not going to rock the boat on that. Just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I also wanted to ask my fellow board members if they would give input to uh, Mr. Gillis. Any thoughts they have on how we can best bring back information to the board and to the public? Because really, the whole point of it was to bring information back so that the board can do their job of oversight and giving direction on this initiative. Uh, so any thoughts that you've got on that, I'd really appreciate it if each one of you could email it to us. The next meeting of the SIT committee is uh, in about a week or so. It's August 17th. So if it's possible to, to get it to us by then, that would be great. Um, and as always, I'm constantly seeking public input, so um, I'm open to that, and I, I encourage members of the public also to give us their thoughts as well. Um, and that's really it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Mr. Collins, anything on contracts we need to be updated on at this time? Or? No, we're okay. spending money with reckless abandon, and okay. we continue to do that, for, <laughs> but only on good things. Thank you very much. Mr. Yofeld, I know. Uh, I'd just like to comment that at our, our retreat, um, internal audit uh, department gave us a PowerPoint uh, presentation on the internal audit group, uh, what they do, how they do it, and so forth and so on. And um, I thought it was very well uh, presented. Um, our next meeting is next Tuesday, so at the next meeting, I will be able to give you a report, an up-to-date report. Thank you. Ms. Williams, anything else on PRC? Um, I wanted to just, uh, first of all, thank you, Chairman McDaniels, for um, a very good retreat. Mm -hmm. And um, I also want to thank the public for <clears throat> all of their comments. Um, when PRC receives uh, draft policies from staff, we, uh, we try to um, be mindful that there's more than one side. And so, Everyone will not be pleased ultimately with what is presented, but we will, I can tell you that in my capacity as chair, we will review the comments that have been submitted in writing to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. All right, um, our next agenda item uh, is board member comments. Um, I'll start there with Mr. Stewart to see if you have anything for the good of the order this evening. Sure, uh, I'll be brief. But I wanted to echo two things that have been noted tonight. The first was by Abby Baton, and it relates to the attraction and retention of our teachers. Uh, I strongly agree that a key part of that effort is providing high quality professional development opportunities. I think we're focused on this issue. I think our system understands its importance. Um, but I'd stress, as we've discussed before here, that it's critical to fund those slots for our cohort programs and to advertise those opportunities well to teachers. Uh, who may be interested. I believe uh, this board might benefit from a presentation providing us with a picture of where we were, where we are now, and where we plan on going with those programs. Uh, and the second thing was a statement that was offered by uh, Ms. Broadwater regarding school start times. Um, I'd echo the importance of at least starting to understand and to study that issue as it relates to Baltimore County. Uh, we're in a unique position to do so, given our significant investment in implementing the technology to improve the efficiency of our transportation system. So I think we're primed to at least have that discussion, and I think that kind of progress can make a real difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Ms. Williams, anything else? For Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Um, I would just like to say tonight that um, I am very proud of the work of the Policy Review Committee led by um, Ms. Romaine Williams along with Marisol Johnson and Steve Vircher, fellow board members that are on that committee. Um, I'd also like to say that with the help of uh, dedicated administrative administration and staff who have uh, helped us review, modify, discuss, argue, um, <laughs> agree, disagree, approve and delete many, many policies. Um, I am just especially pleased that uh, 
fellow board members have helped us pass the heat closure policy, which when we started the work back in September was around and has remained the priority to protect the students in our system that uh, whose facilities do not have air conditioning yet. Um, uh, and that <clears throat> the goal is to provide equitable and effective learning environments for all of our students. And I do appreciate the work that has been done uh, by the superintendent and the county executive and our state funding partners uh, to uh, make the facilities a priority and a focus and have advanced uh, the timeline to make sure that all of our children are learning in, in a wonderful environment. Um, and we do have a great many needs that we are trying to address with the dollars that we have, and, it, and it's, a, it's a constant effort to evaluate and prioritize. So I'm really, um, I'm really pleased with that. Um, also, just uh, back to the capital construction, we're starting to work on FY18. I did submit an email where there's still some questions about the fiscal year 17 um, and the uh, $10 million that's uh, currently fenced off by the Board of Public Works. So I know there's dedication on the parts of many, many people to, to work together to get all of the funding that we can for capital construction needs. Um, I'd also like to say uh, thank you to Ann for her comments about the um, SIT committee. Um, and also thank you, Dr. Dance, for the new position that's been created, the Director of Digital Safety and Innovation. I think that uh, goes along with the uh, increased priority on safety of students in our digital environment. Um, so I'm very pleased with that. And uh, I also want to give a shout out about the Olympics. I mean, who can, uh, who can not be excited about Michael Phelps and uh, with his special connection here to Baltimore County Public Schools with his mom, Debbie Phelps, who's dead so County true. Public Schools. <laughs> um, and also Chase Kalish, who is uh, connected to Baltimore County Public Schools, who has a silver medal. So um, let's get home and wa finish watching the Olympics. <laughs> and I look forward to working with everyone for a new school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. Mr. Yofaldo? Yes, I'd like to discuss one of the board uh, goals that we discussed at our retreat is to make sure that we maintain uh, an excellent educational system. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Economic Advisory uh, Committee uh, to the County Council, and in the future I want to discuss how important our educational system is to the economics of Baltimore County, where we all live and perhaps work. So I, I look forward to uh, presenting some information uh, that the Economic Advisory Committee uh, has discussed relative to maintaining uh, a real sound educational uh, system. Um, one of the uh, pitfalls that we've run into uh, in the past several years is that over the last 40 years, apparently there's been a lack of attention to our facilities, and we're hoping that uh, this board and our current administration, and I know the county executive recognizes that in the future, we never run into that situation again. So I think it's really important to understand the relationship between the economics of Baltimore County, the health of the county, and our educational system, and hoping we'll get more information to the board in the future. Thank you, Mr. Yofelder. Uh, Mr. Collins. <clears throat> Yes, very quickly, if somebody could look at their computer and tell us if Michael Phelps won his race. Yes, it was supposed to be at 928. We um, got a, we got a, a thumbs, thumbs up. up. Thumbs up. It says over here that he did. Oh, really? Congratulations. Yes. Oh, that's very exciting. Spoiler alert, somebody doesn't want to hear. Yeah. Uh -oh. Stop <laughs> that, Mike. Somebody doesn't want to hear. So. Sorry. Oh, spoiler alert. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> se secondly, uh, very quickly, um, I just wanted to observe that uh, since Kathleen joined me on the board, um, many times our other colleagues have reminded us uh, that the length of the meetings are uh, significantly longer since we've teamed up to, ch to chat a great deal of the time, but, but I want to observe that I think that might be a wrong observation because look at this a massive agenda we did tonight in such an expeditious manner in the absence of Mr. Virch, Mrs. Johnson, and Mr. Gillis. So, so if we... So if, we can That's encourage, a, I agree. That's so if we can encourage Mr. Verse, Mrs. Johnson, and Mr. Gillis to stay away more often, we will get done much more quickly because Kathleen and I have never been the culprit at all. That's right. Have a great week. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ms. Miller, anything else? Senator Collins, you might have well have just blamed June Eaton because she's not there either, but oh, we know it was not her. <laughs> all right. Okay, nothing further. Good. Um, just some announcements before we wrap up. Our, let me get to my page here. 
Our next board meeting is Tuesday, August 23rd at 6.30 p.m. here at Greenwood. The opening day for students, as I mentioned earlier, is Wednesday, August 24th, and uh, schools and offices will be closed for Labor Day on September 5th. So that's all we have for this evening. Our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.